staying in old inns or stately homes are sometimes greeted with a ghost story, which can be charming or terrifying, depending on how the spirit moves them, and which room the spectre chooses to haunt. There are hotels in which the supernatural is every day, a whole story where dead men really do tell tales. Those eyes, those milky eyes just kept drawing him in. A hotel where a phantom's embrace leaves visitors gasping for breath. It's a spirit that comes from the front and passes right through and leaves them. And a guest house which is home to a little girl who is 12 years old forever. She hates lights. She likes us when it's nice and dark. Explore another side of the distant past, where ghosts search the night for answers and departed spirits walk once more. Older cities can be great for weekend breaks. Historic houses, cobblestone streets, comforting reminders of a simpler time. But in a haunted hotel, history really does come alive, and in rather unsettling ways. Nestled among groves of walnut trees, the Snowball Mansion Inn is the pride of Knight's Landing, California. According to innkeepers Cheryl and James Furing, in the 1870s, this Victorian Italianate villa was the grandest building in town. Snowball Mansion is a very elegant lady facing the Sacramento River. A little more than 100 kilometers northeast of San Francisco, this former family home delights guests with comfort and tradition, its furnishings taken straight from the Victorian era. Do you notice how that tree... We tried to make a guest feel that they were stepping back in time. The mansion was built to last, constructed entirely from mud brick. The mud was taken from the river, and it took five years for all the bricks to be made. Even the interior walls are brick. Walls built to last for centuries. Walls that once muted an anguished cry that now echoes through time. The haunting story of Snowball Mansion began more than a century ago in the 1870s, when a businessman called John Snowball built this house for his bride, Lucy. John and Lucy Snowball were very happy together. They spent a lot of their time in their home and enjoying the grounds, reading in the grove. The sound came from the land. Before long, the couple was blessed with a daughter. For Lucy, the child was welcome company when John's business took him far from home. I don't think it was easy for Lucy. And her husband was away on business a lot. So when he returned home, it was a special time for her to spend time with him. Each time John returned from a trip, Lucy delighted in hearing about his travels. But on one night, this simple pleasure would rob the couple of their greatest joy. John had just returned from his trip, and Lucy was glad to see him. She went in to spend some time with him after putting the baby down. Lucy had intended to spend the night in her room next to the nursery, but the long day had taken its toll. She fell asleep beside John instead, listening to stories from his recent trip. Lucy slept peacefully, never dreaming of the dangers this night would hold for her infant daughter. The walls being brick, they're very well insulated, so it, noise does not travel in a brick house. In the morning, Lucy woke up and realized she had slept through the night in a bed far from her daughter's crib. She immediately ran to check, in the, check on the baby. That night, 
the earthen bricks of their solid, secure home had muffled the cries of their child in the nursery. That's where she found the baby. John! And the baby was not breathing. Their daughter had died during the night. When Lucy found her child dead, she was devastated. She blamed herself for not being in her room to hear the baby. Lucy laid her daughter to rest, but her grief stayed with her. John struggled to lift his wife out of her sorrow, but the cheerful young woman he had married was gone. I don't think Lucy ever forgave herself for losing her child. I think she felt guilty her whole life and went into a deep depression that she really never came out of. She stayed home and uh, became a recluse. Lucy spent a lot of time in the nursery. Um, for weeks, they would find her in there, sitting by the crib. Though she lived into her 70s, Lucy Snowball took her grief with her to the grave. And according to some, even death has not brought Lucy peace. Ghostly events have led some to see her home in a different light. It seems that ghosts are guests who never leave, troubled spirits never at peace. Many visitors to California's Snowball Mansion Inn believe the spirit of Lucy Snowball still wanders, grieving for the daughter who died in the nursery so long ago. All the children in Knight's Landing think it's the haunted house. Even the current owners feel there is more to this mansion than meets the eye. The oddest feelings is when the windows rattle. It's common for the windows of old houses to rattle in the wind. But at Snowball Mansion, the pattern is most uncommon. The windows will start rattling one at a time upstairs and they'll go across the front of the house, down the house, to the front door, and around the side of the house. People that aren't used to it or have never seen it are quite startled by it. Those who hear Lucy's sad story believe they know the reason for the shuddering windows. It seems sometimes that Lucy attempts to waken guests so that they can check on their family to prevent maybe another tragedy. Lucy's warnings can take many forms. Rattling doors and windows, smoke detector alarms. They say sometimes she even comes to the front door. In the early evening, at dusk, the doorbell will ring and I've gone to answer the door and nobody's there. I'll step out onto the porch, look around, nobody's there. And you kind of get a odd little feeling. Some guests report that Lucy's activities go far beyond rattling windows and ringing bells. About 25 years ago, a renter um, lived in that room and he started seeing Lucy appearing to him. It always happened in the middle of the night when she would come and he would wake up and see her. It made him feel very uncomfortable and he eventually moved. Recent guests at the inn say they've spotted Lucy, still trying to do the best for her baby. A guest told us that uh, Lucy's ghost had come through the wall where a doorway leading into the nursery had once been. I believe Lucy is still in the house because she has never really gotten over the loss of her child. She is still roaming these three rooms. Guests sense Lucy's spirit is veiled in sorrow. 
but on rare occasions, ghostly events seem to hark back to happier times. There's been reports from some of our guests that they've heard old-fashioned music coming from the old ballroom upstairs. And if Snowball Mansion's owners are right, Lucy is not alone. Another spirit is there to comfort her forever. I'm sure if Lucy Snowball spirit is here, that John Snowball spirit is here also at Lucy's side. While some spirits seem to be able to draw comfort from those around them, others appear fated to more solitary pursuits, taking their secrets with them to the grave and beyond. America's rural New England is a land of rolling hills, tidy farms, and small villages filled with history. You feel that that aura of the, of the past and of the past lives and the spirits because you're in their world, their, their space. The village of Enfield, New Hampshire, abounds with talk of spirits. Most of it centered around the Shaker Inn on the banks of Lake Muscoma. Many locals say that the inn's imposing granite walls hold phantoms from a lost society, ghosts which walk in the night. Our guests comment they heard a door close in the middle of the night, or they heard somebody walking down the hallway. I have to tell them there was nobody on that floor. You were the only guest, and I don't know what the sound was. Maybe it was the restless wind, or perhaps a troubled visitor from another realm. There was one life that ended very suddenly and very tragically. Probably that spirit is part of what makes up the feeling in this building. The Shakers came to America from England in the late 1700s in search of religious freedom. In 1837, they began building what they called the Great Stone Dwelling, a manifestation of heaven on earth. Many members of this devout community spent their lives within the six-story structure. This building incorporates their dining, cooking, working, sleeping, worshipping. Everything came together under this one roof. It's a concrete symbol of their communal and spiritual existence here. Long ago, in the building's great meeting hall, the Shakers performed ceremonies said to call forth spirits from beyond. The Shakers believe very much in, in spirits, and that feeling still permeates this whole building. While the Shakers no longer live here, perhaps their spirits still do. Some believe that one particularly ominous apparition is compelled to wander the inn forever. In life, he was known as Caleb Dyer. Caleb Dyer was a very uh, astute businessman, and he helped form numerous mills. Typically, the Shakers kept to themselves. Caleb was the only member of the community who had contact with what the Shakers called the world's people. With Caleb handling their business affairs, the Shakers prospered, but his contact with outsiders would ultimately prove deadly. There was a man named Thomas Weyer. He was an alcoholic. Maybe he had some mental problems. He was really kind of a nutcase. Hoping to get rich, Thomas Weyer prepared to become a paid soldier for the Union Army during the American Civil War. But he was a widower, and he had two small problems to take care of first. He had two little girls who were around nine and 10 years old. And so he brought those kids to Caleb Dyer and to the village and said, I want to leave my kids with you because I know you'll look after them well. Thomas Weyer went off to war. His daughters joined the Shaker community where they were happy. <laughs> but their good fortune lasted only six months. 
Where are my daughters? What are you doing here? I'm here for my daughter. In 1863, Wire returned from the war and demanded his daughters back. Caleb didn't think he was suitable uh, or fit as a parent and refused. Thomas Wire was drunk and he was armed. He said, I want my girls. And Caleb Dyer said, no, we're protecting them. You're not going to have them. And Thomas Wire pulled that pistol out, and he shot Caleb Dyer. The bullet killed more than just the man. It led to the demise of the entire Shaker community. This village was totally dependent on its dealings with the outside world on Caleb Dyer. And as it turned out, the only business records Caleb kept were written in code. All the secrets of how this village was run disappeared. And the village went into a very steep decline after that. Today, the Shaker Inn welcomes visitors keen to enjoy the tranquil countryside and those fascinated by Shaker history. One of the neat things about coming to stay here, you actually get to stay in the rooms and hang your clothes on the pegs and, and use the beautiful built-ins. But as guests are sometimes warned, they may be closer to the Shakers than they think, sharing authentic Shaker furnishings with authentic Shaker ghosts. There are those who believe that while Caleb's bones rest in the old cemetery, his spirit has never left the massive granite building. I've been at this inn for four years now. And really from day one, I began to hear stories about some of the ghosts or some of the feelings in here. When you walk through this building, you can feel the spirits. Many tales from the Shaker Inn are difficult to explain. My chambermaids tell me that up on the fourth floor in room 15, there is a rocking chair that often is just rocking by itself. And there is no wind coming through the building. There will be no guests in the house. And, and I can't explain it, it's just that one room. And there is much more. Stories of impossible events said to take place in other parts of the hotel. And stories that suggest Caleb does not haunt alone. One evening, the assistant innkeeper turned off the lights and closed the building for the night. He left the building and started to drive down the road. And he turned around and just happened to look back at the inn, and the kitchen lights were back on again. Puzzled, he drove back and stepped into the kitchen. He suddenly felt the brushing of hoop skirts against the side of him. And, and he whirled around and looked, and there was nobody there. I think it was a shaker sister reminding him about who was boss. Others have also felt manifestations of this female spirit. She does nothing, except let visitors know she's there. But a recent encounter suggests that Caleb's spirit is uneasy and perhaps angry. One day, a friend of the innkeeper decided to explore the upper floors of the inn. Now, the fifth and sixth floors, we don't use in this building. They really haven't been touched in, in 100 years, so everything is the same as back in Caleb Dyer's day. The friend wandered through long, abandoned rooms. Then, on his way back down the stairs, he met a young couple. And my friend turned to them and said, watch out for the handrailing because it's creaky. 
But as the friend spoke, the young man's face was transformed. He looked at this angry red face, and he said those eyes, those milky eyes, just kept drawing him in. And at that point, he had to leave the building. Soon after, the face seen in the stairwell was found in a painting, a portrait of Caleb Dyer. I just wonder if there's something that Caleb Dyer doesn't want us to find up there. Caleb's responsibility was everybody and everything. And it could well be that his spirit just can't leave here because of that. that there's just so much more that he needed to accomplish. Spirits and specters make no distinctions. From tiny coaching inns to stately homes, haunted hotels are full of eerie tales from long ago. Perched high on a hill just outside London, there is a grand mansion dating back to Saxon times. Its ancient halls are said to resonate with voices from the past. One particular guest even heard a cry of anguish deep in the night. The Selsdon Park and Golf Course sounds solid, English and reassuring. It certainly doesn't suggest anything paranormal. But the hotel's modern touches cannot hide its deep history. As you walk through the hotel, you can really feel the atmosphere, the years of private ownership. There's history seeping from almost every wall. The story of Selsdon Park's most faithful resident dates back to the era of Queen Elizabeth I. Called simply the Lady in Grey, the woman refuses to leave the only home she ever knew. The staff at Selsdon Park now know her only too well. The Lady in Grey was actually a lowly maidservant who worked in the mansion. A very stunning and beautiful, but rather naive young lady, she caught the attention of the Baron. Though she was a humble servant, the young Baron decided to court the maid in secret. Not difficult to understand why. She was rather beautiful and she did fall for his charms. He was quite adept with his compliments and so on. The maid carried out her work, waiting for stolen moments with the young Baron. She couldn't really look at him, but she would catch him watching her or perhaps they would pass in the stairs and he would just quickly caress her as long as, of course, he knew there was no one around. The young Lord filled this young maidservant's mind with all these hopes and dreams. She was of lowly background and perhaps she thought that she could be the lady of the manor. And really she let her imagination run a little bit right in that she really thought that they would have a future together. Then a new development, something the young woman felt would secure their love forever. The maidservant found out that she was carrying the Baron's child. Whether this was something which she set out purposely to do, or whether it was just one of life's little accidents, again, we'll never know. She couldn't wait to tell her lover the news. Time of Good Queen Bess, a love affair between a nobleman and his maidservant. The girl became pregnant and cherished the hope this would seal her future with her lover. Overjoyed, she rushed to tell him the news. Upon hearing the news of the pregnancy, he immediately banished the, the maidservant. He insisted that she leave the very same night. Her dreams of love, marriage and wealth were gone. The young woman was to leave Selston. The maidservant's world literally came crashing down round about her. There appeared to be no way out of her misery. Overcome by grief and shame, she leapt to her death. The 
thereafter, life in the mansion really went back to normal. And although sad to say, the maid servant was quickly forgotten. But according to guests and staff, the young girl is not prepared to rest in peace. Let down in life, she avenges herself in death. She wasn't to be forgotten forever. The lady in grey, the maid servant, was to make her return to the mansion. Many guests at Selsdon Park have shared the same haunting experience. Various visitors to the house felt a presence and many actually saw the figure of the young maid servant dressed in her normal garb, which was long flowing grey clothes. She quickly became known as the Lady in Grey. It seems the Lady in Grey was not prepared to go quietly. She's very much at home at Selsdon Park, though her presence has certainly moved several guests. Many have been so petrified that they've immediately insisted that they be moved to another bedroom. This isn't just ladies or children, this is grown men who so firmly believe that they've seen her. Guests have seen an actual figure, an outline, standing in the room, or even for one guest sitting at the end of the bed. Perhaps because she was betrayed by a man, the lady in grey prefers to visit male guests, and occasionally gives them quite a scare. He came tearing out of his room, screaming, running down to reception in almost just his underwear and demanding to be moved. He would not go back into that room under any circumstances. Guest accounts say this spectre takes many forms and that she brings with her unearthly cold. It's simply been an icy chill which they felt just enveloping their entire body. Even more unsettling are the moments she seeks out human warmth and even human contact. They felt as if it's a spirit that comes from the front and passes right through and leaves them. Guests have reported seeing, feeling and even hearing the Lady in Grey. One particular guest even heard a cry of anguish deep in the night. which we can only assume is the cry she uttered immediately before she leapt to her death. On some nights, it appears this mournful spirit tries to relive happier times in the mansion in the most heartbreaking way. I've seen her in the Tudor corridor, just walking along, dressed in the grey garb and carrying a candle. She's always seen to be heading in the same direction, which just happens to be the direction of the private residence of the young baron, his own private rooms, where they had the loving relationship. Simply by travelling through the hotel, you can experience the sounds, the smells and the appearance of all the tradition and the history. And if you're lucky too, perhaps you'll have a sighting of the Lady in Grey. A door slams. The lights flicker. It could be a gust of wind, or faulty electrics in an old hotel. Or could it be something else entirely? On America's southeast coast, the Rutledge Victorian Guest House invites visitors to discover the beauty of Charleston, South Carolina, and perhaps a piece of living history. I could feel her, like, right behind me. Innkeeper David Lee takes care of the Rutledge, one of several colorful homes known locally as the Painted Ladies. As you walk into the, the wrought iron gate, um, the house is a very large um, Victorian home, Italianate in structure. The house was once home to a family with a lively daughter, Sarah. Sarah loved to play hide and go seek. She loved to have tea parties. She was a typical alive, vivacious 12-year-old. But one night, 
after Sarah had held a doll's tea party, disaster struck. When she was up on the fourth floor, a fire broke out. Trapped in her attic bedroom, no one heard the little girl's frantic cries. Overcome by smoke, she perished in the blaze. Sarah's parents boarded up the house and left Charleston, never to return. The house's charred top floor lay undisturbed for almost eight decades. Then, in the 1980s, the home was turned into an inn. All seemed to go well until the top floor was restored and guests were booked into Sarah's old room. Housekeeper Martha Jenkins believes that the visitors disturbed Sarah's ghost. Your hair rise on your arm and on your back, and you know she's there. Soon after Sarah's room was renovated, one couple had a disquieting story to tell. The wife was sleeping, and the pillow was under her head, and all of a sudden, the pillow was pulled out from under her. She really thought it must be her husband. So she put the pillow back, and then moments later, the pillow was pulled out again. Now she knew it was her husband. So she looked over, and there he was, fast asleep. Who pulled that pillow? Perhaps a spirit can't rest in peace with strangers in her bedroom. Sarah's pranks have even been heard in the room directly beneath her childhood haunt. For about an hour, um, they heard pacing back and forth across the floor, enough to where it actually shook the chandelier. My mother then went and checked her reservation list, and there was no guest checked in um, in Sarah's room. It seems Sarah's specter rarely leaves the bedroom where she took her last breath. But there was one day when she was thought to have ventured beyond the attic. It was a lazy afternoon. Two guests were having tea downstairs in the dining room. They stepped out for a moment. There is still no explanation for what they saw when they returned to the room. When they got back down, the teacups were stacked, one on top of the other. No one else was in the house at the time, but the hotel manager felt he knew who'd been responsible. The innkeeper had said, oh, you don't know the story about Sarah? So up they went. And the innkeeper gave him a tour of Sarah's room and told him the very interesting story about this beautiful young girl who had died at age 12 in a fire. And while they were upstairs in Sarah's room, the strange antics continued below. When they came back down, the cups were stacked again, but in a completely different configuration. This is very, very typical of Sarah. She loved to have tea parties, and this is just her way of now having a little tea party. <laughs> Staff members have noticed that two things seem to vex Sarah's playful spirit, light and heat. She'll turn the lights off on them, and she'll turn it back on. And they'll come downstairs, and there goes Miss Martha. The light went off, and it came back on. And I'll just say, it's Sarah. The reason for Sarah's aversion to light seems clear. 
I don't think she liked the light because of the fire, because lights do bring heat. The bulbs and the electrics have been checked. They're not responsible for the darkened rooms at the inn. Our light went up, and I'll go check. There's no shortage. There's nothing wrong with the bulb. There's nothing wrong with the light. And I'll just explain and say, it's Sarah. She hit lights. She likes it when it's nice and dark. Late at night, as they head up to Sarah's suite, some guests say they have seen a small pair of eyes watching them through the window over the stairs. Or have had some guests that have thought they've seen someone looking out the window. But guests and staff say you don't need to see Sarah to know she's there. Her presence can touch other senses as well. The air in the South Carolina hotel is scented with magnolia, except when Sarah's at play. You can smell her coming because her clothes still smell like the smoke. So you know that Sarah is there. Martha believes that Sarah's spirit is only content when the sweet sound of gospel music fills the halls of her old home. She loved the song, I'm your little girl, and I'm sitting here waiting for you. And I know you are my angel, so I want you to come out and play. And then she'll relax and come out. The outside of a hotel can be made of wood, brick, stone, even adobe. But it is the inside that determines its spirit. The Karakia Pension Inn has been an oasis in the desert east of Los Angeles since 1924. It is unlike any other hotel in this busy holiday resort. Just two blocks off the main street, Karakia's gates shield visitors from the outside world and welcome them into a far-off land. Exotic Moroccan bungalows surround a lush courtyard where guests can relax by the pool or spend the night under the stars. But as they unwind, they may start to notice a strange feeling in the air and wonder just what may be stirring within the whitewashed walls of this desert jewel. Today, Karakia's exotic grounds, Mediterranean pools and stylish rooms are often chosen by photographers as the backdrop for fashion shoots. We're still going strong with photo shoots. It's a beautiful place. It just is a place that's conducive for photos. But when the cameras come out, it seems so does the ghost of Karakia. Those who know Karakia's history think they know the specter's name. Gertrude. In the 1930s, she worked as a painter's model. Gertrude married an artist named Gordon Coots, who had spent his younger years working in Morocco. Coots wanted to share his passion for the country with his wife, so he created a little bit of Morocco in the middle of California. This was a labor of love for it to be her castle where she could reign. But Gertrude's happiness was torn away from her when her husband suddenly died. She was alone in the house where their romance and passion once thrived. But Gertrude was widowed at a very young age, and she was to have a second chance at love with a close friend of her late husband's. John Lavery came to console Gertrude, and they ended up falling in love and had another torrid affair. Laverly, a well-known painter, loved Gertrude to distraction. A new chapter in her life began, and romance came back to Karakia. 
You have that romantic painter energy, and then you have Gertrude, and you can imagine that they both really thrived here. The couple would often entertain their friends, the artists and writers of the day, in Karakia's lovely grounds. One night, John and Gertrude gathered their friends around them for a celebration like no other. As the splendid evening unfolded, the guests never suspected that this night would be their last at Karakia. As the champagne flowed, Gertrude looked up to meet her lover's eyes, but he was gone. She slipped away from the party and went to look for him. Karakia, California. The building is now a hotel, but in the 1930s, this was home to a woman called Gertrude and her lover, an artist. The couple were famous for their parties. Until one evening when the lover went missing and Gertrude left her guests to try to find him. She rounded a corner and stepped into the road. The lights of the car speeding towards her illuminated her lovely face for just a moment. Then she was gone. Gertrude's violent death had a profound effect on Karakia, according to front desk clerk Tanya Fruhoff. Gertrude, I think, was the heartbeat of the hotel and plugged energy and, and vitality into it. And she died young. The actual building was in solitude for a while. Gertrude's home was abandoned, full of nothing but memories for almost six decades. Until 1993, when the building reopened as a bed and breakfast, Karakia was reborn. Although time has passed by, it's been brought back to what it was when it originally was built. General Manager Floor Schechtel sees the hotel's romantic tradition flourishing. It's a, a place where people come and just fall in love, not only with the actual structure, with the history of Karakia, but fall in love with each other. But today's lovers sometimes report that their privacy has been disturbed. It's the most amazing thing. You feel the air kind of caressing you. At Karakia, the breeze seems to have a mind of its own. Many guests say they have seen the swimming pool ripple for no apparent reason. As the ripples spread, guests feel a cold chill down their spine, even on the hottest of days. It could be the heat and people lose their mind, but I definitely feel that, that Gertrude is, is here. The evenings that follow Karakia's sunlit days are decidedly romantic. When well, the sun goes down and the music starts and the candles are lit and the fire pits are going and there's just nothing but candlelight. I mean, we hardly have normal light bulbs on the property. At night, it's pretty much candlelight. But sometimes the candles won't stay lit. Even on nights when the air is still, candles seem to blow out of their own accord. Such ghostly attention can be pleasing and unnerving at the same time. She's still around and you feel this deep presence, like it never ended in a way. But it's Karakia's fashion shoots that seem to make Gertrude's spirit truly come alive. Look right here, there you go. If there's a photo shoot happening, I'm sure she's coming out for it. <laughs> I'm sure she wouldn't miss it. Some report more than just a feeling. They believe they have physical evidence of Gertrude reliving her past. When models leave their rooms, they often return to find that someone or something has been trying on their clothes. Their things are not the same as where they left them. Maybe she likes to try, you know, the beautiful gowns. Perhaps the photo shoots take Gertrude back to good times long gone. She can't resist playing with the model's makeup. Things happen and, you know, Gertrude is, is here in some shape or form. And if she's not moving lipstick, she's definitely reigning over the photo shoots. 
It appears Gertrude's vital spirit lives on in the place where she knew both joy and pain. Gertrude was the heart of the place, and we still feel that pulsating to this day. And if the rumors are true, on the anniversary of her death, a slender form can be seen walking towards the road. Perhaps it is Gertrude, retracing her last steps, her last moments of life. It's a magical place. It's a, a mysterious place. Um, it's a place that you let your imagination just kind of run wild because it transcends you. And it seems the touch of one passionate soul will be here forever. The tales of those who lived and died long ago add character to a hotel and bring its history to life. On nights when the moon rides high and the wind begins to rise, spirits and phantoms may draw near, connecting guests to people and times long gone, but not forgotten.